September 13th, Sunday, and this is week 13. We're talking about financial power of attorney and elder abuse this week. Very cool. All right, I'm going to get this out of the way so I can scroll. Um, your CT2s are awesome. We're grading them right now. I, I hope you guys had a lot of fun. I know you did. It's kind of cool to watch your money grow. Uh, what else do you have to do? Don't forget, it is right around the bend, so that's your next thing. Your midterm comes up. That's your next assignment followed by your paper. Okay? So remember, the midterm is open for two weeks. So unlike the first midterm, we wanted to give you the flexibility that you could take it the last week of class or you could take it the week before the last week of class. So it's opening Sunday, um, November 20th in the morning, first thing, 1201. Yeah. And then it'll be open through the last day of class, Friday, December 2nd. Awesome. And, and, and you um, have two hours to take the exam. Yes. Um, if you have uh, an OSAS letter, you can send it to us. It's never too late to let us know about that. Final paper is due December 7th, right? Which is a Wednesday. Right there. First day of finals. Okay. Um, and extra credit is also due that day. So the extra credit, you can, um, you know, we have the directions on Blackboard. You can video yourself talking about, you know, responding to the prompt and email me your video or upload it to Google Drive and send okay. me the link. You can um, write something. You can send photos, you know, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. I've had people write songs. I've had people write poems. Um, I don't say poem correctly. <laughs> My kids always make fun of me. Sorry about that. And um, yes, poem. poem. It's poem. very hard for me know. to say. <laughs> anyway, so um, so yeah, and let me know if you have any questions. All right, cool. Okay. Let's go right into it. Let's our get into week. it. Sorry about that. There we go. It's coming. Okay. Hey, and dogs. Right. Our elder dog is like seeking oh, attention. She just fell down. Uh -oh. Sorry. She's kind of she's going to fourteen almost, and the hindquarters aren't working yeah. so well. Kind of like my hindquarters. Okay. But she still likes to get. Pets. All right. Very cool. And Financial so we did we did this last week, guys. Okay, we're talking about health. This one's even more interesting. Who do you trust to pay your bills? Who do you trust with your money? Okay, all right. The uh, video is going to go right here, and I'm going to let my attorney do the talking. Okay, so we have a pretty simple reading from AARP. They do a lot of good stuff explaining things. Um, they also have some great resources we'll talk about next week in terms of preparing your own will or trust. Um, and basically, why do you want a financial power of attorney? A couple of reasons. Should I go into the file? Yeah, okay. go, go ahead and open up the document. Okay, so why would you want a financial power of attorney? Sometimes you need to have um, uh, financial tra transactions occur and you may not be available. So if you travel a lot, if you're LeBron James and you want to buy real estate or sell real estate or or you know, buy stock or sell stock or something like that, you might have given someone a financial power of attorney to carry out those transactions for you. So they would be able to sign for you. Um, as part of our estate planning, I've given John a financial power of attorney for me. He's given me a financial power of attorney so that if he's out of town or if he's sick or unable to do it, I can sign documents for him. Um, and our kids. And our kids. So as I always like to have layers and layers and layers in case John's not available, um, then my older son would be number two and my younger son would be number three. You know, like, for example, we drive off a cliff together. But, <laughs> but we're still alive. <laughs> so we survive. We're in comas. We're in the hospital. Sounds like a soap opera. Mm -hmm. And someone has to pay our bills. Yeah, someone so. has to take care of, you know, paying the mortgage and, and, and taking the dog to the vet and, and paying, you know, all these things. Um, so anyway, so we live in a legal world. So if you don't have your ducks in a line, then you get stuck. Yes. If you right, do not on. have a power of attorney for healthcare or financial and a person becomes incapacitated due to health reasons, maybe they develop dementia, maybe they're in a car accident and they're in a coma, then you have to go into court and get a conservatorship. That is painful. Um, it can take time. It's expensive. And all of a sudden the court's involved in your business, which isn't always a great thing. Just ask um, Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, having to do a conservatorship, it's a lot easier if people plan ahead and create these documents like power of attorney for financial, power of attorney for healthcare in advance so that you choose who's going to make these decisions, who's going to who's going to take care of these things. Cool. So All right. are we in a good place? Yes. Here? Just right. like with the power of attorney for healthcare, you are the principal. So I'm the principal and I make John my agent. So just like hiring a real estate agent, if I want to go buy a house or if I want to be a professional athlete, I hire an agent to represent me in negotiations with whatever team I might be signing a contract with. John is my agent, so he can carry out transactions for me. Um, 
And, and this will give her, as it says over here, it give you some peace of mind. Okay. Yes, All right. Yes. So you want to make sure that if you do create a power of attorney, that you pick someone that you trust with money matters. So you might, you know, you might have a, a financial power for health purposes. I mean, a power of attorney for health purposes. You might choose a different person for that than you would choose for your finances. So you want someone who's detail oriented, who's honest, who's trustworthy, who hopefully is financially stable themselves and someone who's, you know, good at paperwork and things like that. So that would be the person that you would want to pick. Um, typically, financial um, power of attorneys have options. So when you look at the document, you can say, which is what I did and what John did, um, that I give my agent, John, a broad authority to buy and sell stocks, buy and sell real estate, pay my bills, sign income tax returns, deal with my insurance. There's a whole laundry list of probably 15 different things that you could select. Now, what if... Um, you're LeBron James, you travel a lot and you want to buy a house, but um, you're going to be out of town when, when the documents need to be signed. You could create a power of attorney for financial purposes that would only check the box for buying real estate. Yeah, a single and then you would, transaction. And then you would limit it. And you could probably say this is only good for October 1 through October 31st or something like that. So um, there are ways to have a limited power of attorney if someone doesn't want to give away, you know, kind of the keys to the store, so to speak. What's a springing power of attorney? Well, there's three types of power of attorney. Scroll down a little bit. We have a conventional, conventional power of attorney that starts when you sign it and it ends when you become incapacitated. Because the idea there is you're giving someone a power of attorney for a limited purpose, but when I'm incapacitated, something else is going to take over. You have a springing power of attorney, which springs into effect. So it goes into effect typically when you become incapacitated. I don't love those because then you have to get and you know, then you have this evidentiary issue. Mm -hmm. Is the person incapacitated Capacity. or not? Maybe you have to get a doctor to say that the person's incapacitated. So you have proof issues with that. What we have is a durable power of attorney that begins once it's signed and it remains in effect during my lifetime or John's lifetime, unless I cancel it. So that's usually the most practical, easiest thing to do. Now, Unlike a durable power of attorney for health, where you can find documents online really easily, it's a little bit more difficult to find a good document for a durable power of attorney um, for financial. Um, so what are your options? One is most commonly what you need this for is to pay someone's bills. So you go to that person's bank and they will have a form that they want you to sign that gives you the authority, the, the power of attorney to pay that person's bills with that account at that bank. So you might end up getting documents, getting forms from their 401k account or their pension or their checking and savings account at the bank. So that's, um, and even if you hire a lawyer to draft a power of attorney for financial purposes, the bank is probably gonna want you to use their own form. So you're gonna run into that issue. Another form they might have you sign is a uh, beneficiary form. So when you Absolutely. do die, yes. when you do die, the money goes, to the beneficiary. Yeah. So, so if you have a checking, has to be lined up. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a checking or savings account right now, you can probably log in online, go to your bank's website, and if you dig deep enough, they will have what they call a transfer on death. Um, or a beneficiary statement or something like that, where you can say, if something happens to me, this is who I want to get my account. So that's my money. Who's we'll, gonna we'll get my money? We'll talk about that more next week. So um, powers of attorney expire when you die, and then the person no longer has the authority to make decisions for you. So you want to you want to choose someone trustworthy. Right. Oftentimes it's a family member. It might be your your spouse or partner. It might be your um, sister or brother. It might be your child. It might be a friend. It might be a neighbor. It really depends on your situation. But then when we do the trust and wills, when you die, some of these things, the balls still are in motion. Right. So somebody still has to pay the bills. So yes, absolutely. To, so. Absolutely. And so then that would be the executor of your estate would be named so, so that to, comes to next. pay those bills once you die. Okay. Um, so once you have a power of attorney, um, what I recommend is, let's say grandma's um, starting to show early signs of cognitive problems. Someone needs to pay her bills. Usually the first thing, indication we see when someone's starting to show early signs of dementia is their bills are getting paid late. So someone in the family steps up and says, I can pay their bills. And we all trust that person. That person's a really good person. We know that they're really good and really reliable. However, I, my 
personal feeling is trust but verify. So you've given someone a power of attorney to take care of grandma's bills. What you should also do is have a way of overseeing the account. So I use an app called Mint, um, not Mint Mobile, <laughs> but Mint. And um, I get notifications on my phone if, um, if, for example, the bills for my utilities were um, higher than normal or my bills for my car insurance was higher than normal or uh, the amount I paid on my mortgage was higher than normal. It'll say, hey, is this correct? And you go in and check it. And I can go in at any point in time and I can look at my account and say, okay, these are the, these are the things that cleared through my account. Um, and so it's a really great way of putting everything into one place so I can look at my 401k, whatever investment account savings checking, um, bills, things like that. Um, so that's like a good way. Personal GDP. It's a good way to trust but verify. You're tracking the person's account. So you'll see if suddenly they just spent $5,000 at Best Buy and you know that grandma doesn't have a really um, need for high-end electronics, then you know, okay, somebody's gotten a hold of their credit card or their account or something like that. So good thing to do. Um, when you are the power, of, when you are the agent, so you have been named the agent for the principal who owns the accounts, you don't have an ownership interest in their, in their accounts. You are supposed to act with the greatest loyalty and the greatest um, integrity by paying their bills for them, but you don't get to take that money and spend it on your own stuff. So you can't um, take that money and go buy a car or take that money and go take your friends out to dinner or anything like that. You only can use that money for the purpose to benefit that person and to carry out um, their instructions or, or to, to handle their needs, okay? okay? So you can't use it for yourself and you can't keep it. How do you cancel a power of attorney? So let's say you've, you've signed a power of attorney and you named your partner, your spouse, um, your longtime friend, and then a couple years go by and you don't live in the same place or you, you don't talk anymore, you know, you've kind of moved on, people get busy, and you're not really that close. Well, you can tear it up, sign a new one naming someone else. So whenever a court sees that or a bank or any, anything, you see that new power of attorney with the new date and you say, okay, that prior one is no longer in effect. Um, you can send a letter and it's good to notify the person to say, hey, I've, I've canceled this power of attorney, I'm letting you know. Um, and make sure that uh, if, if this power of attorney has been provided to your bank that you provide them with the new one and the new agent um, that's, that's authorized to act on that account. And, you know, for example, you get divorced and you didn't update your legal documents. Yeah. Okay? So this is why you got to keep things, uh, you know. Yeah. And a lot of together. states, a lot of states will say that automatically upon divorce, your power of attorney or um, a power of attorney for financial or for health would automatically be canceled. Um now, you might have a really friendly divorce and um, you still want that person to have that authority. Then you, you, what the best thing you can do is to sign a new power of attorney after the divorce so that then a court can say, OK, after you knew you were getting divorced, after this happened, you still wanted that person to make these decisions for you. So it's, right. it's possible to do that. Um, one of the reasons we talk about uh, financial power of attorney and elder abuse at the same time is that in the U.S., um, financial abuse is the number one type of elder abuse. So I want to talk, kind of walk you through some really cool graphics that we have um, from the USC elder abuse website. Um, one in 10 older people report um, some type of elder abuse. It could be emotional, physical, sexual, um, neglect um, every year. But the most common that we see is current financial abuse by a family member. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but it happens. And so that's what you should be on the alert for is financial abuse and neglect. Um, when someone isn't being taken care of, if they're being isolated, you try to go see grandma and the nephew or, gra or grandson or whoever is, is living with her and taking care of her won't let you in the house. Oh, grandma's sleeping. You can't come in. So be very, very alert if someone starts to be isolated and you haven't seen them lately. Or if, if when you do see them, if they seem um, different, if, they're, if their mood and their affect has changed, if they have bruises that are unusual, if their glasses are broken, the hearing aid's missing, the their false teeth are gone. You know, there's all these indicators that we can see that are signs of elder abuse. You know, it's so, always that family member, you know, that one that's a little off, you know, that brother that doesn't quite launch, you know, <laughs> that that uh, the cousin that suddenly is living with your mom 
saying they're taking care of her and it, you know it's that that um the, you know, litmus test, the taste test, you know, the smell yeah, test. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. If, if your gut tells you something's going on, listen to it. Um, because older people are vulnerable, go, go back up again. Um, in most situations, older vulnerable people are going to be abused by either family members or caregivers. So either paid caregivers that are coming into their homes, or maybe if they're in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, it might be an employee at that facility. And so we're seeing, you should be scrutinizing those two categories of people, family members and care and paid caregivers to, to keep an eye on what's happening. Um, what's tragic about this though, is that older people are very reluctant to report elder abuse when it's a family member because they think, oh, um, I'm, I'm a burden. Um, I don't want to get this person in trouble. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. Um, if I do get them into trouble, who's going to take care of me then? I'll be completely alone. And so it's, it's really a problem in terms of uh, preventing or stopping elder abuse that, that older people don't want to report it. There's a lot of shame involved. So brings us to our next statistic. 93% of elder abuse is never reported. Um, for that reason, we have mandated reporters, so people in the health professions, um, police, fire, uh, people who come into contact with older people, employees of nursing homes um, are all mandated reporters. So if you see that something's going on and you don't report it, um, that could be a felony in, in most states. So that hopefully increases the likelihood that... Um, that uh, when elder abuse is happening and the individual who's being abused doesn't report it, it increases the likelihood that someone who sees something will say something and notify the, the appropriate authorities. Um, people with dementia are at much higher risk of um, elder abuse. 47% in this one study showed that people with dementia had been mistreated by their caregivers. And, and that's for a lot of reasons. Um, people with dementia can be very, very challenging to take care of. Um, they may be aggressive, they may be argumentative, they may not be the same sweet person that you knew before. And so that increases a, a lot of stress on caregivers. Um, they're also, um, I hate to say it, but if, if someone with dementia says, well, so-and-so has been hitting me, people might say, oh, you know, they're just like confused. They don't believe them. So um, they have moments of clarity. Yeah, though. they have moments of clarity, <laughs> and so pay attention. If some, if, if, right. if an elderly person in your family says so and so has been hitting me or so and so has been stealing from me, try to pay attention and figure out. Look at them. Are they showing signs of injuries? Are there things that are missing in the house? You know, these things. Um, unfortunately, even people that we really trust can sometimes be doing these bad things. Um, elder abuse is associated with the higher mortality rate. So self neglect. People who are um, neglecting themselves are more likely to die within a year. Um, people who have been confirmed, uh, confirmed victims of elder abuse are twice as likely to die. Even in a suspected case of elder abuse, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, they're almost 1.4 times uh, as likely to die as compared to the average person. Now, when we talk about elder abuse, a lot of times my students say to me, oh, this is an American problem. And a lot of students come from other countries where the culture is very much to respect and, um, and treat older people with dignity and respect and kindness. However, what we're seeing is that worldwide um, elder abuse is a problem. And I can understand how this is happening. We are, they call a lot of people the sandwich generation. You're taking care of your children. You're trying to establish your career. You're taking care of your parents. And it's a lot. And so stress. a lot of stress and, and trying to juggle all those balls and keep everything going in the air can be really, really difficult. So the next little section is a World Health Organization um, document that explains the types of elder abuse we see. Obviously, physical abuse is probably the easiest one to detect because you're going to see bruises and, like I said, broken glasses. Um, sometimes you'll see rope marks on someone's arm, hands and, and wrists if they've been restrained. Um, that can be physical um, uh, abuse or um, uh, drugging someone, so chemical restraints, physical or chemical restraints. Um, psychological and emotional abuse is also very common. You're telling the older person you're worthless, nobody loves you, no one cares what happens to you. Um, you know, I can do anything and you won't be able to do anything if you, about it. If you it. tell other people you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, 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 which is very, very sad. Yeah. Okay, scroll down. 
Okay. And then sexual abuse luckily is rarer. I think it's the least common type of sexual of, of abuse that we see. However, if your loved one is staying in a nursing home or a, a lot, some sort of long-term care facility, it's not uncommon for one patient with dementia to um, sexually assault another patient with dementia because oftentimes people with dementia act out sexually. And so that is something you have to be on the alert. It can be aggressive physical abuse or it can be sexual abuse. And occasionally we do see long-term care employees who unfortunately are um, discovered that they have been committing sexual abuse against the patients as well. Um, and then there's financial and neglect. So those are um, the basic categories. It's as we said before, family it's members. often family members or healthcare care workers, workers, caregivers, um, just, people who are in a position of trust. You gotta be vigilant. People who are spending time yeah. with the older person. So I really like this table from um, the World Health Organization because it talks about what the risk factors are. And if we just sat around and thought about it, we could probably come up with this, but they did studies and came up and verified the data. And so what we see is if someone is disabled, independent, having a significant disability, that's a strong risk factor for elder abuse. You might be isolated in your home, you might not get out and see other people. So suddenly whoever is having contact with you has a lot of power over you. Um, so generally being in poor physical health um, makes you vulnerable to elder abuse. Um, suffering from depression, you're less likely to complain about it if you're suffering from depression. Um, being low income or low socioeconomic status. I had a law school professor, legendary guy, who used to say, rich people get better stuff. He says, you gotta accept this, rich people get better stuff. If you are wealthy and you're living in this wonderful, amazing mansion, you have a personal trainer who comes three times a week, you have a cleaning lady who comes five days a week, you have a gardener, you have a driver, you have a chef that comes and prepares healthy meals for you. You've got a lot of people that have eyes on you, a lot of people that are seeing you from day to day. Um, and that engagement and being surrounded by people means it's more likely, not always, but more likely that if you are being abused, that it will be discovered. Now, um, sadly, what I teach in another class that I teach with graduate students, there are a lot of cases of wealthy, successful people who have been the victims of elder abuse because they had money. So it, it, you know, it can cut both ways. Um, what we look at also, um, cognitive impairment, again, dementia, social isolation, all of those things combine to make you more vulnerable. Now, who are the perpetrators? Um, family members, caregivers. If it's a family member and they suffer from depression or alcohol or drug abuse, then they may be more likely to not deal with the stress of caregiving very well. They may be financially dependent upon the person. Um, and all of those factors, financial dependence, emotional dependence, being related to the person, um, all of those factors combine to make that caregiver more likely to become an abuser. So be careful. Um, I think, you know, probably many of us have family members who have a history of drug or alcohol abuse. And if that person needs a place to stay and everybody says, well, they can stay with grandma, she has the room, just be careful. Just know that that person's at risk of maybe not dealing with the stress well of becoming a caregiver. And so um, they might need to be um, to get to get uh, respite care so they aren't you know 24 7 responsible for this older person we have the caregiver resource center like we talked about many times this class at usc that that that's what it's all about to to help people that are under a lot of stress from being caregivers yeah and um if the if the perpetrator lives alone with the victim that's another risk factor so if you're in a multi-generational home and you have you know, three generations, four generations living in that home, it's a lot less likely for elder abuse to happen. And that may be another reason why sometimes people from other cultures and other countries who are more likely to have a multi-generational home say, well, this doesn't happen where we're from. And maybe it doesn't happen because you've got a lot of eyes on, on grandma um, making sure that she's okay or he, you know, grandpa. So the next little thing is just um, uh, different experts in this field of elder abuse highlighting what the issues are. So um, a lot there, a lot of them are talking about financial abuse and how to avoid financial abuse. Um, there's a, an expert who talks about the, the shame that if you are from a culture where um, elder abuse is, is 
not part of that culture. Um, if you are from China, if you're from Armenia, you know, a lot of countries where we're treating elder, elderly people with respect and dignity is, is such an important part of the culture. Then when it happens, it's super horrifying, super shameful. And then that unfortunately might trigger depression or even suicide on behalf of the victim because they feel like if this is happening to me, I must be worthless. I can't do anything about it. Um, it's better for me to be dead than for me to be a burden on my family. So, so be, be alert to that. Um, they're talking about social isolation. Social isolation is a huge risk factor. If someone is not engaged or having people um, come check on them, then they are at more risk um, for elder abuse. And, and then this is oversight. This is, yeah. You know. And another thing that's really great, when you talk about financial elder abuse, when this, this guy's um, recommendation is have multiple people helping this person manage their financial affairs. So you've got a little bit of a fail safe. You know, you wouldn't run a company where the same person writes the checks and signs the checks and audits and does the tax returns. You wouldn't want to do that because you'd want to have a second set of eyes looking at the income stream and, and expenses and, and, uh, and income to make sure everything makes sense. So There's a lot to, to, you know, to think about, but it's, Wait, you know, just, you just take, done? I know, I know, okay. but I'm, I'm just not, I'm telling you to take it all in and then we're going to get down to the bottom down here. And then Julie's going to go over the prompt. No, there's more. I know there is. There's no, there's more. more. Do, 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 do. There it is. Loneliness and isolation. So I love this graphic. Um, we teach a class about the mind-body connection um, in the summer, and we talk about stress and the effect that stress has on your body and aging and how to, how to manage stress. And one of the things that we see is that sociality and, and having quality relationships is one of the most important factors in aging successfully. So the flip side, unfortunately, is that a lack of quality relationships, loneliness and isolation can also lead to very, very bad negative health effects. So you're at higher risk of having a physical and mental decline. You're at higher risk of having dementia. It's the same physically in terms of your health. It's just as dangerous as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is mind blowing because we know that cigarettes are bad. Um, go down a little bit. See this? <laughs> okay. Um, and it's a risk factor for depression. Now, before you panic, because during the pandemic, a lot of us have been spending a lot of time alone or maybe less social than we were before. And even now that the pandemic's kind of, you know, slowing down a little bit and things have opened up a lot, a lot of people have told me, I'm not the same person I was before. I used to be really outgoing and now I'm, I'm kind of afraid to leave my house and I'm just not engaged socially. The important thing is how you feel about it. So if you feel lonely and you want to have more social contact, but you don't, then you should do something about it. If you are alone and you're content with that, maybe you've become a more introverted person. Maybe you're perfectly content listening to music or, or playing, you know, video games or whatever, and you're content and happy with that situation, then it doesn't cause all of these, um, all of these, uh, bad health effects. So a lot a lot of what we've learned about um, isolation is that you can be isolated without being lonely. Um, so anyway, so what we see with um, with uh, older people in terms of you know what are the risks of loneliness and isolation? Being older, over eighty, having chronic health problems, so it's harder for you to get out of the house. Um, not having close family around, so having a lack of contact with family, which we see a lot in the U.S. People move far away. My dad is, you know, 2,000 miles away, and I'm trying to handle his health issues from far away and get back there when I can. It's it's hard. Being low income, so you're not going to be going on that cruise with your friends, and you're not going to be going to the casino, and you're not going to go to Vegas to, to you know, um, see the Raiders play or whatever and changing family structures. So we have um, a lot of people getting divorced, um, a lot of people choosing not to have children um, and, and complicated families where maybe people have been married a couple times. And so you don't have the same, you might have different relationships um, and you might- My, have, my um, mom way outlived my dad. So my mom, my dad died when he was 87. My mom was 80. Yes. And she lived another 15 years, you know? So she had to restructure her whole life. She actually had a, had friends 
they all died off. Said she had to make new friends. She had to make new friends. So when she was in her nineties, her friends were in their seventies because her original group of friends um, got older and didn't live as long yeah, as she so did. There's a change um, in, in structure right there. But for you. she benefited, and she was really lucky that she had three sons that all lived in the in the LA area. And we all and converged so and supported. So she got that great family support, and right. we were all involved in her care and, and her, kept an her, eye out for that's her. That's the matriarch right there. <laughs> Anyway. So anyway, so what do we do to prevent or, or, or address loneliness? Make sure seniors have transportation options. If you can get onto a, you know, like in our neighborhood, they have this little bus that'll come pick you up and take you to the senior center. And then you can do classes or, or exercise classes or take a class on using computers or something like that. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of attention being paid to um, senior communities, communities that are friendly to seniors, that are very walkable, where you might you might live there and there's entertainment there and there's shops and it's easy to get to the grocery store um, and technology. I, I think technology is is wonderful and you know we're going to see a lot more use of technology. My um, my stepdad lives alone in Florida and he's got a lot of disabilities, a lot of mobility issues, and he has one um, one of those uh, like a life alert type devices that if he falls, he can push a, push button, a button and someone will come check on him. And so, um, you know, we have technology that will say, hey, um, so-and-so hasn't opened the refrigerator door yet today, or so-and-so hasn't gone to the bathroom yet today, so-and-so hasn't gotten out of bed yet today. Um, you know, we have security cameras around the outside of our house, but we could have them inside our house so that someone far away could look in on us and say, oh, um, you know, you haven't had breakfast yet. And, you know, the cost is going down and down and the technology is getting better and better. So, and I know a lot of you guys are looking to, you know, obviously to, to make a difference, but also to set yourself apart from all the other applicants for all the other grad schools or jobs. Um, so here's a great source of volunteer work right here. Um, so if you, if you can volunteer with seniors, senior centers, um, community support groups that support seniors, it's a great thing to do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we talk about this all the time when we look at dementia and we look at um, diabetes and we look at the health issues that people have as they get older. If we could have volunteers or pay people to go to an older person's house and get them up and walk them to the end of the block and back once a day, we'd probably see our rate of dementia go way down. We'd probably see our rate of heart attacks and strokes go way down. We, we would see this incredible benefit to society. Right, so but, now that you've actually had the benefit of Julie telling you all about your discussion prompt, and right? So, so, um, so here it is, right? Now you should go, th go through all this material on your own again, just to re-familiarize yourself, and then address the, the, the questions or the issues that we raised. Have you seen discussion. evidence of elder abuse? Um, a lot of people have with their, especially with their grandparents or great grandparents. How did you feel about it? What do you think we need to do to, to prevent elder abuse? Um, especially when we know the risk factors, we know um, that certain people are going to be higher risk of being abused. So how do we, how do we solve this problem? And again, it's a worldwide problem. It's not just a US problem. Um, it's a worldwide problem and something that we really, in every single country, need to think right. about. I think when, in the future, when we develop communities, this can be, you know, a, a part of it. You know, we look at real estate development and in these communities that look out for each other. Write that into it. Right. Okay, that's all right, I got. Cool. All right, guys, um, have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Fight on, Ski. Fight on. <laughs>